Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This time it started as a routine search for a rich girl's fiancé, and the trail led to a silent house haunted by a face at the window and blood in an open cedar chest. But before it was over, it became a search for a corpse that wouldn't sit still. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Busy Body. Phone jerked me up off my back and out of the sports page at 9.30 in the evening of an already too long day. On the other end was a warm, feminine voice edged with a kind of self-assurance that means money, and lots of it. But the words were both hurried and panicky, so after I hung up, I reluctantly waded through the sports section with my feet instead of my eyes and headed for the coffee shop at Franklin and Bronson, where my new client, who had identified herself as Liz Stewart, said she'd be waiting. A pair of blue eyes at a table in the corner measured me from haircut to shoelaces, so I took the cue and walked over. After we introduced ourselves, I was waved into the chair opposite her, She leaned toward me and started with a rush. Mr. Marlowe, I've got to find a man named Dean Howard as soon as possible. Not exactly a new switch. He's my fiancé. We plan to notify my Uncle Hanley of our engagement tonight. Who is Uncle Hanley? Uncle Hanley Stewart of Stewart Aluminum. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, Dean. Dean Howard was to meet me at 7, but he didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And then about a quarter to 8, he called. He started to tell me something about... Something that he referred to as a horrible mistake, but before he could get it out, we were cut off. Well, I tried to call him... Want some coffee? Hmm? Coffee! Uh, no, no. Okay. I, I tried to call him back, but there was no answer. So I went to his house, but it was locked and dark. And yet his car was still parked outside. Uh-huh. Well, look, Miss Stewart, why don't you save yourself 50 bucks, go home and wait for an apologetic phone call, huh? What do you mean? Well, this stacks up as being a case of cold feet or a little celebration that got out of hand. Either way, there's nothing to worry about. I've come to you for help, Marlo, not a pat on the head. Okay, okay. I'll assume it's my error for the moment. How long have you known this Dean Howard? Well, I, I met him at a party about three months ago. Mm-hmm. Uncle Hanley and I both liked him tremendously right from the first. I suppose you've considered the possibility of another woman? Well, of course, I'm not a child. I can see that. Well, <laughs> Dean has been deeply troubled for the past week. He wouldn't tell me why, but I, I'm certain that this business tonight is tied in with it. Something's wrong, and I want you to find out what it is. All right, but I'm no leg man for Cupid, so if it turns out to be nothing more than a guy's heart beating in double time, I drop it. Fair enough? Fair enough. She gave me a short list of posh joints she and Dean Howard sometimes visited. And his address, which was 312 Normandy. She said I could reach her at home, which was 28 Roxbury Drive in Beverly Hills. Well, 50 bucks is 50 bucks, so after she left, I spent a handful of nickels checking the list by phone and drew a complete blank. So I drove out Los Feliz to Normandy and found the number 312. As I walked up to the door and leaned on the bell, I got the feeling that I was being watched. There was no answer, so I tried the door. It was locked. I threw a look over my shoulder as I walked around the side of the house and caught a glimpse of a face in a window next door, just before the curtain was dropped back into place. The back door of 312 was locked, too, I found out, as did the face next door, which was watching me again from one of the rear windows. There was one answer to that, so I went out in the street and up the steps of the house next door and knocked, good and loud. My name's Marlowe, lady. I'm a detective. You may be able to help me. A detective? Mm-hmm. Well, come right in, Mr. Marlowe. It's about time's all I have to say. I'm Agatha Lambrigger. What's he been up to? Who? Well, you're investigating that bachelor next door, aren't you? Yes. Oh, <laughs> how'd you know? Huh. Stands to reason. I've known all along he's a suspicious character. Yeah? Lived there a year now. Comes and goes at all hours. Drives that fancy car out there. Wears fine clothes, but nobody seems to know what he does or where he gets all his money. Well, look, Mrs. Lamb... And girl... Oh. Well, believe you me, they don't come to clean his house. Hmm. Never gets cleaned. But they come just the same. Why, only tonight there was one. Some blonde in a white dress. I tell you, I've never Mrs. Lambrigger, did the girl go inside? 
Well, no, but she tried to. The door was locked. <laughs> and it's uh, Miss Lambrigger. Oh, how stupid of me. Uh, <laughs> well, tell me, did you notice Mr. Howard come home tonight? Well, I didn't exactly see him come home. But he was over there all right. And not alone either. Is that so? Another girl? No, no, it was only some man. Oh. But it still bears out what I've been saying. Because I just happened to glance out of my window at this one here across uh-huh. from that one of his, you see. Yes, sir. Well, a light was on over there. And I could look straight down the hallway. And do you know what? What? Those two grown men were roughhousing like a pair of hoodlums in that hall. Wrestling they were like ordinary ruffians. I tell you, I never saw the like. I got a good look at him, and I'd certainly know him if I saw him again. Mm. Well, how'd the fight come out? Fight? Yeah. What the... Oh, oh, the fight. Well, well, I can't say about that. My phone rang. It was Lenore Crowley. She simply talks her ear off you when she, she gets does. started. Mm. So when I finally got back to the window, uh, well, when I happened to look out again, it was dark over there. So I never did find out what actually happened. But yes, I well, thanks it... very much for your help. I really must run. Oh, and another thing. The noise and the drinking that's gone on in that house. Why, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, you're leaving? As soon as possible, yeah. Oh, but you still haven't told me what he's up to. Well, I'm not at liberty to do that. I, uh... Oh. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Well, I'll be here all the time, you know, and I'll certainly keep an eye on that house. Oh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your going to all this trouble just for me. <laughs> Bonsoir, Miss Slambrigger. I backed out of that wind tunnel, got in my car, and drove noisily around the corner. Then I cut my lights, turned quietly into an alley behind the house, and stopped. Slipped through Howard's back gate and up the side of the house, found a window that could be persuaded and went in. Yeah, Howard was a lousy housekeeper, and everything that didn't get brushed off in normal traffic was covered with dust. I found my way to the room opposite Agatha Lambrigger's observation window and ran smack into her first lie. Where she said there was a hallway, there was a solid wall, papered with purple roses and hung with four dingy pictures in bronze frames, two on each side of a big, ugly mirror. There were two hallways, but no angle at which either could be seen from her window. Furthermore, there was no sign of a struggle. One hall led to the study, the other to the bedroom, and I checked both. But still, there was no indication of a fight. On my way out, I barked my shin on the nose of a lion carved on the corner of an oversized cedar chest, just as the abrupt sound of someone at the door brought me to a rigid halt. Whoever it was had the patience of an eight-year-old on circus day. So I set myself up as the type who might live in a joint like this and entered Hmm. Uh, what's the matter with the lights, Howard? Blow a fuse? Or could this be some new economy measure? I like it this way. I don't think I know you. You should, Howard, you should. I called you yesterday about a certain money matter. The name is Leo. Uh, don't go for your gun, Howard. Well, since yours is pointed at my third rib, why should I? Well, like I told you on the phone, my boss is anxious. You're way overdue, Howard. I want that 50 grand the boss loaned you three months ago. Have it for me the day after tomorrow. All of it. Without fail. He knows I'm good for my debts. Why all the pressure? Well, maybe he figures your investments aren't so smart. Like maybe you've been blowing too much on that second-rate canary, Carol. Oh. Oh, yeah, Carol. I remember. Mm. She's your girl. Yeah, well, that's none of my business. See you day after tomorrow about the same time. And if you get a headache from worrying about paying off, just think of the one you'll have if you don't pay. It'll be like ten times this. Good night. The forty-five in his hand caught the side of my head, and I went out cold. When I opened my eyes, the room had shrunk until there wasn't enough space left to stretch out in. And the climb to my feet. Oh. <clears throat> It was as easy as roller skating through a log jam. And it wasn't until I found a match and had a light that I knew why. Somebody had moved me from the front door and crammed me into a broom closet like a bag of wet wash. When I got out, I saw that my cubby hole was off the hall of the bedroom. I listened, but there was no sound in the house, so I started moving. But stopped when I noticed something else. A big cedar chest with carved lions on the corners that had been closed before and now was standing open. I struck another match. Inside on the bottom was a thick red puddle of blood. Blew out the mansion, was in the middle of a mental apology to Liz Stewart when it came. I ran for the front door in time to see Agatha charge out of the driveway and down the street. Stark terror twisting her face. Help! Help! Hey, Miss Lambringer, hold it! Oh, Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! 
What is it? What happened? I saw him, Mr. Marlowe. I saw him. Oh, by the alley near the hedge. He's dead, Mr. Marlowe. Dead in my backyard. All right, all right. Now take it easy, Agatha. Who was it? He's there now, lying on his back close to the hedge, and he's dead. What'll we do? Come on, we'll have a look. You can show me where he is. Well, well, all right. He's right back here. I I happened to look out my rear window, and I, I saw something move. The dogs had been getting in my pansies lately, and I, I thought this was another. So I came out to chase him away. That's when I saw the body. It, it's right back here. It, it's gone. Mm-hmm. Now look, Miss Lambrigger. I've got a headache. I'm getting a little tired of this. You saw a body here just like you saw a fight in the hallway from your window. You're so anxious to be in the middle of things, you'd make up any kind of a story. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I, I saw that, Python. I saw Dean Howard's body, too. It, it was here, I tell you. Where? Show me exactly. Well, right right about there, I'd oh, say. Oh, sure, sure. And I suppose it... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. My apologies, baby. There is something here. Could be blood. Here's two dimes and a bar receipt from the tulip room on the strip. Oh, good heavens. What will you do now? Raid the place. You can use my phone. Thanks, but until we know where the body is, we better play it cagey. Now, let's keep this a secret between us. That'll take a lot of courage, I know, but I can trust you, can't I? I I won't open my mouth to a soul, Mr. Marlowe. Well, that's great. That's splendid. Now, you better go inside and stay there until you hear from me. Who knows? You may yet be a heroine, Miss Lambrigger. The bar receipt was a long shot. When I was still two blocks away from the tulip room, I knew it had paid off because a fluorescent banner, 4 by 12 draped over the front of a squat square building, extolled the vocal virtues of one Carol Cody. I parked across the street, went in, and found a dressing room door and knocked. She distinctly said, come in, but when I did, I thought the room was empty until a small handful of spangled satin costume hopped up from behind a screen in the corner. I made a sight-unseen introduction. It was only a moment later that a tall brunette filling a white silk blouse and snug, dark slacks, stepped out. Tossed a few pounds of glossy black hair away from her face and gestured me into a chair. Which paper did you say you were from, Marlo? I didn't, honey. I'm a private detective. I can't use it. Don't give odds on it, baby. Not yet, anyway, huh? Let's talk first. For instance, what's with you and Dean Howard? Dean Howard is mm. a low-crawling thing. That's strange. Had it you loved him? I didn't till tonight when I found out that he has two heads... That's so he can lie and keep a straight face with one while he laughs up his sleeve with the other. Nuts to him. Nuts to Liz Stewart and her money and nuts to you. I hate Dean Howard enough to kill him, and I might just do that. I don't think you will, no, because somebody beat you to it. You... You mean Howard's dead? Looks that way, yeah. I'm not sure because he won't stay in one place long enough. If you're trying to shock me, you're wasting your time. I'm not sorry. One... I think we've got company. Keep talking. I'll get him. Uh, as you say, my friend, the music business is just as lousy as any other dodge, and I can prove it. Come here. You're a good listener, bud, so join the party. Who are you? Why are you listening out there? Come on. No, 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 just, just a minute. I wasn't listening. I was looking for you, Marlowe. I'm Ward Odom, Mr. Henry Stewart's assistant. You're doing fine. Don't stop now. Well, I... Ever since I learned that Miss Stewart hired you, Marlowe, I've been trying to talk to you. I, I followed you here from that place on, on, on Normandy because I must know what you found out so far. Why? What business is it of yours? Because, Mr. Marlowe, I doubt very much that you even know of the robbery. Robbery? What robbery? More than $40,000 worth of negotiable securities were stolen from Mr. Stewart's safe this evening. You get all your information at keyholes? Hmm. And I have reason to believe that the man you're looking for took them. Of course, I don't dare accuse him without proof of his relationship with Liz, uh, Mr. Stewart's niece. If I were wrong, it, it would cost me my job. Odom, did Liz know about the robbery when she hired me? Why, why, of course. Oh, brother. Look, see this? Her name is Carol. She's involved right up to her mascara in the whole mess. I'll let her out of your sight till I get back. Me? Why, you cheap shot. Shut up! And as for being cheap, I'll take care of you when I get back. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Busy Body. Convincing Ward Odom that his greatest contribution to the cause would be staying close, but not too close, to the violent lady in slacks, 
I piled into my car and started for Beverly Hills in a beautiful liar named Liz. I didn't stop until I was at number 28 Roxbury Drive out of my car and walking fast up the semicircle of gravel driveway that led to the carefully antique front door. But then, for two good reasons, I stopped again. The first, a squad car parked ahead of me that said everybody except Marlowe knew all about the bonds Mr. Hanley Stewart could no longer call his own. The second reason and more important was my client, Liz Stewart, sneaking out of a side door and hurrying toward a gray coupe. I stepped back into the shadow of a squat palm and waited for her to come abreast of me. Late date, Miss Stewart. What? Marlo, why, you you startled me. Considering everything, it's the least I can do. What do you mean? I don't like clients who lie to me. So if you don't mind, I'll just stroll along with you while you assure me you can explain everything. But I can, Marlo. Just give me a chance, please. All right. Why didn't you tell me that 40 grand worth of negotiable bonds disappeared from your uncle's safe at the same time as Howard? Oh, because I didn't want you to be prejudiced, to be looking for a thief from the start. If Dean did take those bonds, he had a reason. Like being fond of money? No, like being forced to do what he did. All right, let's say he was forced. What then? Well, then I wanted to help him, to get to him before the police. They'd arrest him in a minute. And you, on the other hand, would get the bonds back to your uncle, convince him it was all a mistake, and talk him out of telling the law, huh? And with your own dough, you would help Howard out of the spot he was in, is that it? Yes. But you haven't proved the dean took the bonds. No, I haven't. Could have been anyone who knew the combination of the library safe. Which includes how many? Uh, aside from Uncle Han and myself, just the, the family lawyer and Mr. Odom. Yeah, what about Odom? Could he have done it, Liz? No, I, I don't think so, as much as I dislike him. Mm. You see, Marlowe, for years, Odom's been very close to Uncle Han. He's had a thousand opportunities to steal if he wanted to. Well, like this afternoon, for instance. He had $10,000 worth of the bonds with him today. What was he doing with all that dough, paying gas bills? He was going to sell them for my uncle. But the transaction fell through, so he brought them back to the house and put them back in the safe. Anyway, Marlowe, I don't think he'd have the courage to steal. I know what you mean. I've already met Mr. Odom. When? Oh, about a half hour ago. In a nightclub called the Tulip Room. Odom thinks Dean is guilty, Liz, but he's afraid to mention it publicly till he knows a little more. What's the nightclub got to do with Dean? Carol Cody. Who? She's Dean's girlfriend. Marlowe, you're crazy. I talked to her, honey. She's a singer there. Told me that she and Howard were more than chummy, but that she gave him the air tonight when she found out about you. And you believe that? Mm-hmm. Now that I've had a little time, I believe even more. The tales that she never bothered to mention, the tales like Dean Howard and Carol Cody playing you for a sucker. He gains your confidence, then the combination of the safe, and then goodbye. But you see, the end was a switch, Liz. Dean... D didn't... Dean didn't what? Hmm? What is it, Marlowe? What are you staring at? Back of my car there. That's not gas dripping on the driveway. The color's too red. Liz, stay back. No, Marlowe. I don't want to. I want to... <laughs> Marlowe! It's Dean! He... He's dead, Marlowe! <laughs> yeah. That, Liz, is the switch I was talking about. I think Dean Howard not only crossed you, but Carol Cody as well. She did it! She killed him! All right, all right. Now listen. Get inside. Tell the police about this. Do you hear me? But first, give me a five-minute lead. I'll take your car. I want to get to Carol Cody before the law does. Without saying another word, Liz Stewart, her face drawn and streaked with tears, handed me the keys to her car and turned and walked slowly back to the house. I took one long look at the blood-soaked shirt front on the body I had been a step behind all night then got into Liz's car and pointed it back toward the tulip room. Twenty minutes later, when my knock on the locked dressing room door brought no answer, I had kicked my way in. Alone and half-conscious in the middle of the floor was Ward Odom, a man I'd assigned to stand sentry over the brunette. Oh, Marlo. Marlo, she tricked me. Asked for a cigarette, then I went to light it. She, she... swung. It adds, Odom, and you're lucky she let it go at that. It was more permanent in Howard's case. Oh, oh then, then you found his body, Marlo. Yeah, in the trunk of my car. Oh. Oh, how awful. And she did all that, this Carol Cody? Yes and No. She must have had help, Odom, because... First of all, it takes something stronger than the chanteurs to keep shifting her corpse from sea to chest to garden to car. The rate that Howard was being moved. And second, an old crow named Agatha Lambriger saw a man roughhousing with Howard over at his own place, not a woman. You, you mean there was a witness to the murder, Marlowe? Well, more or less. And you have no idea who the murderer is? No. And that, Odom, is all the more reason why I want to catch up with Carol Cody. Happen to know where she lives? So, why, why, yes, yes, just at the Grayfield Apartment Hotel on mm -hmm. North Havenhurst Drive. It's North a, Havenhurst. It's a room, room 118. 118. And I think that it's... Marlo! Marlo, wait, my top coat is gone. What? Yes, and she was wearing slacks, remember? 
Marlowe, maybe she's leaving town disguised as a man. It's a point, Odin. I still think I'll try the apartment hotel first. <laughs> What are you doing here? Not doubling for a bellhop, so get over there, sit down, and keep your hands in your lap, because if I have to, I'll shoot. But I don't understand. I'll make it real plain. I think you murdered Dean Howard because he double-crossed you after he emptied Hanley's steward safe. And I think you're out of your mind. Which brings us to a position called stalemate, and that in turn makes this a good time to call the cops. I didn't kill Dean. I swear I didn't. Oh, listen to me. What you said about Dean double-crossing me after he stole the bonds is true, but not the way you think it is. Second verse. He didn't want to just cut me out of my share, Marlowe. He wanted to return all the bonds intact. He really fell in love with Liz Stewart and decided to play All-American Boy. You mean he decided to call it all off after he'd stolen the yes. bonds? Yes, Marlowe. That was the reason we argued tonight. Well, it's a stronger reason than the one I already had for your committing murder. Baby, you wanted that money bad. No, you're wrong. Come back here! Why did you belt Odom and run? And don't bother denying that you did because I just left him. And he's minus good health in that top coat over there. So if you think I that you... I can explain that. I, I was scared that a confession out of Dean would get me into hot water. And when you showed and then Odom... Just I... a minute, Carol. But Marlo, just I... a minute, will you? I think I've got the answer. What answer? It's dust, Carol. Dust and what an old gossip swears she saw from her window. Right now, I've got to get over to her place before she ends up looking like the late Mr. Howard. Well, then, then you believe me, Marlowe, about not killing Dean. I don't know. But since you've been in on this cheap swindle from the start, we'll what? just tuck you into an old-fashioned wardrobe. Just for safekeeping, oh. baby! Outside in Liz's car, I slammed my foot down hard against the accelerator and didn't ease up until I screeched to a stop away from 310 North Normandy, where I knew murder was scheduled to happen again. And I was next to a pair of half-open French doors through which I could see Agatha Lambricker sitting erect in a straight-back chair. I was happy that I hadn't taken any longer in getting there. I was also happy that the man standing opposite her gun in hand, the man who had murdered Dean Howard, had his back to me. I got a firm grip on the 38 That's in my hand. you've been so nosy, Miss Lambricker. And it's too bad that Marlowe had to let me know you've been a witness when I killed Dean Howard. A rough house, I think you called it. A rough house is what I thought at the time. But when I saw Dean Howard's body out in the alleyway, I knew... You knew I killed him. Everything would have been simple if you hadn't had your nose out a mile. I was going to run over him. And it would have looked like an accident. But I had to move the body after you saw it. Marlowe's car looked good until I could dispose of it. But there's no point telling you all this. You won't be able to gossip about it, Miss Lambrigger. I'm sorry. Sorry, but that's the way it has to be. You or me. I vote for you, Odom. Well, drop your gun before I close the polls for good, real noisy-like. Come on, drop it. No, no, don't shoot. I dropped it, I dropped it. Okay. I moved to the middle of the room, hands high. Marlo, Marlo, I didn't want to do it, but I had to kill him. I had to. Dean Howard was going to return the bonds he took. Marlo, and that would have left you in a me. spot, wouldn't it? Because Howard only stole 30 grand out of that safe, you were taking 10 grand to legitimately sell for your boss. Yes, I know what And I when you went to return them, you saw there'd been a theft. And you decided to make the most of it and let somebody else take the rap for the whole 40 grand. Don't worry, a man who shoots another man in the back has no guts. He won't try anything while I'm looking at him. No. No, Marlo. I I don't have any more guts than it takes to jump behind a woman's skirt. A lady I choked to death. If you take one more step, now lower your gun and listen. All right. Let her go, Odom. Sure. Sure, let her go. Just as long as you cooperate, Marlo. Marlo! Marlo, don't be a Shut fool! Up. Shut Marlo, up! Marlo, shoot! You kill me anyway, shoot! No! Shoot. No, don't shoot! Marlo, Marlo don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Huh. You were right, Marlo. No guts. <laughs> It was an ambulance, a half a dozen squad cars, and a police captain included, and three long hours of questions and answers in triplicate later. Before 310 North Normandy and Environ settled back to being just another quiet house on just another quiet street. With, of course, the exception of Miss Agatha Lambrigger, who now would never return to normalcy. <laughs> and as we sipped hot tea together and a clock someplace deep in another room struck twice... 
Now, Philip, though, I'm sure I had She was right. still going strong. Dean Howard owed money, so he and that worthless singer decided that he should get friendly with your wealthy client and then at the propitious moment rob her uncle, correct? Correct, yeah. But what I don't understand is how you knew it was that awful man Odom. Well, there were two things, honey. His anxiety to get me to Carol, together with a streak of dust the length of Odom's topcoat sleeve, all added up to a hunch. That, Philip, I don't understand. Well, you got to take him in reverse order. I saw dust on Odom's topcoat sleeve when I was in Carol Cody's apartment. That reminded me of the dust all over Howard's place. Oh, a mess, that house. Yeah, luckily. And the dust was the length of the sleeve, as though somebody had brushed against the wall, coated thick with it. As one would in searching for something, hmm? That's right, that's right. Now, there's another thing. You saw Howard and another man roughhousing in a hall by looking out of that window there. Mm -hmm. Where, Miss Lambrigan, no hall is visible. But where there is a mirror. Oh. Then you mean I actually saw a reflection. Yes, darling, you did. Dean Howard hid the bonds behind the mirror. Which tilted so that I saw the reflection of a side hall. That's right. Well. Now, Philip, one last question. Why did Odom move the body? Well, if it's the last, I'll answer it. (laughs) Because he didn't want Howard's death to appear a murder on the night the bonds were stolen. It was better if he died accidentally and wasn't connected with a theft. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, now, look, Miss Lambert. Excuse me, I'll only be a minute. Yeah, but Miss Lambert... Hello? Oh, hello, Judith. Yes, yes, wasn't it thrilling? Miss Lambert, really, I... Darling, it all started so innocently. My part, I mean. Well, it was about seven Miss Lambert, I have... Philip, I'll be with you in a minute. Oh. Philip, who? Why, the detective, the one I mentioned earlier. A long minute, I'm sure. Goodbye, girl. (laughs) When I got outside, the silence was deafening. Then I remembered that I still had a client up on Roxbury Drive who I had to see. And that there were automobiles to be exchanged, and maybe, if I could find them, some right words to say to a girl who had a very rough night. So I started driving that way, slowly... But ten minutes later, when I was halfway there, I stopped, turned around, and headed back for 310 North Normandy, and my 38 that I'd forgotten after a handful of policemen had finished examining it. It wasn't until I was at Agatha Lambriga's front door again that I realized something more important. Well, then this Odom, this killer, grabbed me as a shield, Judith, and told Milo he had guts enough... <laughs> guts was his word, my dear. Yes, well, I could get my gun another day. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crazy star, Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lois Corbett, Lorette Philbrandt, Lynn Allen, Peter Leeds, and John Stevenson. The special music is by Richard O'Ron. Be sure and be with us again next week. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>